Scythe was published in 2016 by Stonemaier Games. It was designed by Jamie Sigmeier and illustrated by Jakub Ruszowski. Stonemaier Games provided this copy in exchange for an honest review. One of five players control a unique faction attempting to become the richest and most powerful force in alternate 1920s Eastern Europe. Factions have three types of units, eight wooden workers, four plastic mechs, and one character. Beginning at your home base, you'll move and add units to take control of territories, gain and spend resources, battle opponents, and upgrade technologies. You have a faction mat and a player mat with action columns. These combine for a unique combination and outline starting popularity, power, coins, and combat cards. Deploy mechs from the faction board to unlock mostly unique abilities. Each player mat's top actions are similar but in a different order. Bottom actions are in the same order but vary in cost and benefit. On your turn, move your pawn to select a new action column. You may do the top, bottom, or both actions. If you choose both, you must do the top action first. Top actions allow you to move, trade, produce resources, or bolster your troops. Be sure to pay any cost. Bottom actions let you upgrade future actions, deploy mechs, build structures to strengthen other actions, or enlist troops for bonuses. The main board's labeled hexes indicate its produced resources once it's controlled. Lakes are mostly impassable. Controlling the factory in the center counts as three hexes at the end of the game. The factory provides an in-game bonus as well. Once reached, take a factory card to add an additional action to your player mat. Each card's top action is to unique. The bottom action lets a single unit move twice. The 11 encounter hexes are seeded during setup. If a character ends its turn on one, discard the token to draw an encounter. These unique cards allow you to make moral choice for a thematic bonus and cost. The tribe track shows 10 different goals, such as winning combat twice, deploying all four mechs, and reaching maximum popularity. Place one of your six stars once achieving a goal. The game immediately ends once a player places their sixth star. Coins are points. Receive more coins for the Triumph Track, Stars, Controlled Territory, and every two controlled resources. The popularity level acts as a multiplier. Finally, earn coins for building structures based on the bonus tile. The player with the most coins wins. There are a few additional things I've left out or will discuss further later in my review, but this gives you a general idea of how the game works. To break it down, deploy units, expand your territory, and achieve stars to be the most dominant faction. That's Scythe. Our multiplayer games of Scythe, including Setup and Takedown, took about 30 to 35 minutes per player. By solo learning, it was just over 90 minutes. Because of the learning curve, expect your first game to be in about an hour per player. Despite the included Automa, plus the unofficial Scythe kick app, I preferred this multiplayer over solo. It was more interesting to figure out what mom and dad were doing and racing them up the tracks. The central play areas take up a lot of space, being when solo games will hog tables. Give yourselves at least 3 by 5 feet. The rules and decision complexity mean that kids under 11 probably won't be able to play on their own. Asymmetric games are trickier to teach and learn because the teacher needs to be familiar with more than the basics and or what's in front of them. Scythe is a beautiful well-made game. The art is incredible. The plastic and wind components look and feel nice, and the plastic minis remind you that only they can engage in combat. The layered player boards keep wooden components from sliding around, though ours have warped a bit since opening the game. I'm glad setting up the main board is quick because players need to put an effort to prepare their side before starting. If two people familiar with the game are introducing one or more newcomers, I recommend one player focuses on setup and the other explain general gameplay and rules. Answer specific questions as best you can, then jump in. We found that turns were quick, and downtime was low aside from combat or triggering multiple things on a turn. This is more common later. In fact, turns got longer as the game goes because of what you built and are unlocked. You'll want to weigh everything carefully in case the end is triggered. The rulebook encourages experienced players to finish their bottom action while the next player begins their top. Because scoring depends on calculating your multipliers, the rulebook provides a variant, delay of game. This prevents players from spending 10 or more seconds calculating other players' scores, slowing everyone else down. If caught, that player loses two popularity. Harsh, but fair. Despite similarities between factions and player boards, I found them unique enough that I had fun exploring the 23 available combinations. For those wondering about the math, a few combinations are banned in the rules. Anyhow, the best thing is that you're guided without being forced. One may be slower deploying mechs and quicker getting workers, but you could still focus on mechs first if that's your preference. I like building engines, and the chain actions and engine here are very satisfying. Build structures and unlock bonuses when performing that top action. Enlisting unlocks bonuses when you or your neighbors perform that bottom action. Early on, it's rare to have the resources to take both the top and bottom action. Later, resources are everywhere, sometimes tempting you a hex or two away, and you'll have little choice but to leave the safety of your territory. 
The simple combat, spend available power up to 7, plus a power card means that players won't be waiting too long if you and another wage war. I like how you can keep workers with your mech or character prevent others from attacking. After all, sending a huge mech to scatter workers will cost a player popularity. This system works well to keep this from being a skirmish game. Honestly, if you've earned your triumph star for two combat victories and your engine hasn't been taken over by opponents, there is little need to keep fighting. Luck in this game is relatively low. There are no dice. Combat cards are random, but gaining them is easy, plus you can always spend power to compensate. Hidden objectives are straightforward enough that you'll likely deduce your opponents early on. Factory cards are powerful, so you want to make sure you aren't the only player without one. Even the structure bonus tile is public and lightly won't determine who wins and loses. The popularity track typically does. Me and Dad talked about the feel after one game, where Mom said she wanted to attack me, but was afraid of my power. Despite this being set in the 1920s, it has a Cold War feel. Everyone respects each other's strength and is afraid to start something unless you're certain you'll win, or what they have is vital to your victory. Because it's points, coins, that win the game, it may not be wise for a player to trigger the end. Context is everything. Mom overestimated her strength in our fourth game. She challenged Dad to combat and he won. It gave him a score in combat victory, earning him a 6 star. I was like, You've got to be kidding me. I had a big turn coming up and had a scheme to prevent dad from ending the game on his turn, but mom threw all of that out the window. I'm obviously not upset because it made for a fun moment. The push your luck element plus popularity modifier keep things interesting right up until the end. I wanted to bring up that type of contextual tactical planning because while this game offers strategy, you have moments where you'll have no choice but to pivot, even if it's only temporary due to the game state. I talked about solo games against the Automa and Family Facts, but I like that you can use it while playing with people. It's usually me, mom, and dad, so it's nice to have a fourth player even if it's just a bot. Sice look is very appealing. That its tight design led to success in gaming circles and it soon found mainstream popularity like another Stonemaier game I reviewed, Wingspan. When my parents first heard of it, they heard it was really complicated, and I would heard the same. The asymmetry, huge board, and multiple options seemed tricky, and certainly would to someone like my grandma. But everything kind of makes sense. I enjoy Scythe a lot, more than mom and dad. Turns are quick with plenty of options and strategies, and faction combinations plus pair choices make this replayable. If you're drawn to the theme and enjoy area control, you may want to give this a try, especially if you like games where you grow in power. If you want lots of combat and player interaction, this probably isn't for you. This is European style research engine where you'll occasionally be heads when someone has what you need. Hopefully my video helps you decide if Scythe is what you need.